Hello, everyone. My guests today are uh, Robert Wilson and Paul Milgram. Uh, Bob is the Adams Distinguished Professor of Management Emeritus at the Graduate School of Business. His research focuses on game theory and its application to business and economics. He has been a major contributor to auction designs and competitive bidding strategies in the oil, communication, and power industries and to the design of innovative pricing schemes. And notably, uh, three of Bob's students have gone on to receive a Nobel Prize. Uh, Al Roth, who we talked to earlier this quarter, uh, won his Nobel Prize in 2012, Bengt Holmstrom in 2016, and Paul Milgram in 2020. And this is a true testament to Bob's uh, brilliance as, as a mentor, uh, in addition to a researcher. Uh, Paul is the Shirley and Leonard Ellie Professor of Humanities and Sciences in the Department of Economics and Professor by Courtesy at both the Department of Management Science and Engineering and the Graduate School of Business. Uh, his research is very wide-ranging and he made profound contributions to game theory, to the theory and applications of auctions, to market design and to industrial organization. Uh, Paul is one of the most cited economists in the world uh, with over 100,000 uh, citations. Wow. Now, Paul is the co-founder of Auctionomics, an auction consulting software and software company uh, that designs and assists bidders in high-stake uh, auctions. And together, Bob and Paul are the co-recipients of the 2020 Nobel Prize in Economics for their improvements to auction theory and, inven and inventions of new auction formats. Uh, Milgram and Wilson are credited with shaping the entire modern telecommunication industry uh, as they designed the first radio spectrum auction in 1994 by the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC. Uh, auctions using their design have been used worldwide to allocate licenses worth uh, billions of billions of, of dollars. Uh, both Bob and Paul uh, are distinguished fellows of the American Economic Association. They are members of the National Academy uh, of Sciences, and they have received numerous uh, other major prizes. So Bob and Paul, thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Now, I'm sure many of you have seen the viral video of uh, Paul receiving mm. the news from Bob, uh, uh, the news about his Nobel Prize. So maybe that's a good, maybe that's a good place to start. Uh, maybe, Paul, maybe you can tell us how you received the news. <laughs> I was asleep. Uh, yes. <laughs> and uh, with my phone off, I only have a, these days, only have a, a mobile phone. And, um, uh, and apparently the, they were trying to call me from Stockholm. My wife was in Stockholm at the time. She's Swedish. And uh, she could... Uh, um, she had, was suspecting something was afoot, especially when Bob showed up at 2 o'clock in the morning, knocking at my door, trying to wake me up. And some of you have seen we have a doorbell video, and the doorbell video uh, uh, appears on her phone in Sweden uh, at 2 a.m., so she saw Bob before I did, and uh, Bob, Bob and his wife, Mary. And uh, they said, Paul, get up. They're trying to call you from <laughs> Stockholm. So... Yeah, pretty much my version of the story. And, and Bob, like, uh, how did you end up knocking on Paul's door at 2 a.m.? Oh, because the, um, the Nobel people that had called on my phone said, well, we can't reach Paul Milgram, and we happen to know that you live across the street. <laughs> so would you mind going across the street and, you know, waking him up? So. This, it must be the, the only time in the history of the Nobel Prize that... Uh, one Nobel winner is knocking the door of another. Yeah. <laughs> uh, of course, it's not a total coincidence that, uh, that uh, you live across the street from each other. You've been like lifelong uh, friends and, and neighbors. And uh, in fact, Paul, you were, you were Bob's student. And you know, urban legend have it, Paul, I'll have you confirm or, or deny that uh, you actually chose to write your first paper on auctions mostly to impress uh, uh, Bob and to have him as your, uh, as your advisor, is that? Uh... So that's uh, true. <laughs> um, it, it's uh, um, actually one of Bob's other students who was a year ahead of me at the time was Bengt Holmstrom, who 
was the uh, Nobel laureate in 2016. And Bengt was a student of Bob's then, and uh, I was admitted to the program. And I said, well, I don't know anything about this. You know, what do I need to, be, to do to be successful as a graduate student? And Bengt said, you need to get Bob to be your advisor. Um, so, oh, OK. Um, I don't know how I'm going to do that. So Bob was teaching his course where he was covering a, a bunch of recent uh, research papers. And he included his own paper as one of the papers in the course. It was a paper he had written about auctions. And, and um, I thought, well, maybe if I could write my term paper and improve his result, um, he'd be impressed by that. So I made it my task. I took on trying to improve um, his research paper, and Bob was really excited. I can't tell you how excited he was when I uh, came to see Bob because uh, apparently he'd worked really hard on this. You had Dave Krebs working with you, you told yeah, me, yeah. on this too, and you know he'd worked with other co-authors. They couldn't get anywhere, and um, I turned in a term paper that replaced a sufficient condition in a certain theorem with a necessary and sufficient condition. I, I totally nailed it, and... Yeah. Uh, Bob was excited and, and uh, told me, oh, you're all done. This is your PhD thesis. I mean, he went wild. So uh, that was my story. It, it worked out quite well for you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was a spectacular thing to do, right? And, and you, so, so how do you two work together, Bob? Like you, do you think very similarly about research or do you have, are you kind of complementing each other with the way you think about problems? <sighs> Well, we're actually quite similar in the sense that we both have a, our research on theoretical topics is motivated by these practical aspects. So I think that's true, of Paul. I mean, you're, mm -hmm. so uh, your encounter with all these different problems of market design is what leads to some of your theoretical work. And that's been true for me. Yep. And you know, there are fields where people say, well, you develop theory, and it's like, you know, what the, the standard analogy is, it's like a hammer looking for a nail to hit. But we work really quite differently. It's like you, you look at practical affairs and then extract from that some theoretical essence or some idea or basic problem that can be addressed with theory. Right. So that's, we're both theorists, but uh, uh, theory is at the end of a chain of motivation that comes from the, the practical aspects we encounter. I, I know, uh, yes, Paul, go ahead. I, I just uh, want to say, I, so I approve of that 80%, okay? There's a 20% there's a piece that's really missing out of this. The, you know, the, all the theory that we studied gives us a, a set of perspectives that sometimes need to be changed or mixed or matched, but we don't start from nothing and just observe the world and, and uh, and try to find a, a, a theory that fits the world. I mean, you and I know certain things. Some of the things we know are in common. We learn things from the, you know, all the people who came before us. And uh, we do our best to make them fit. And if something close to something we know fits, that's the, uh, there's an opportunity for a theoretical innovation. No, no existing theory uh, fits this, explains this. But you know what? It has elements that are, that are similar, and I can figure out how to adapt it. And, and make that work. So I think. Um, What's the uh, other twenty percent? Okay. Yeah, well, if we are totally in agreement, that's great. But we, but I've, I, we're, we're, I'm told at some point we're supposed to give advice to students, and it isn't just that you. Uh, I mean, yeah. you need this broad education you, uh, in order to have a whole set of of, of perspectives and narratives and and so on available to you. So when you look at something, you know, you can. Um, uh, you can see it from several different angles and figure out, you know, what's going to work and how you explain it and what you do. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and Bob, like, uh, I, I know that uh, te you're still teaching, uh, you know, like, and uh, that I know that your, your students, for both of you, your students are very uh, important to you. But I want to ask Bob, like, what does it mean to you that three of your students <laughs> went on to win the, uh, the Nobel Prize? Well, it was, uh, to me, it means these were, you know, these extremely bright people and uh, their, their talent just became manifest. But uh, so I was sort of there, I guess in some guidance way, but actually not, nothing very substantial. Um, 
But the thing was that at that time, there was a revolution going on in our field. In economics, we were using, trying to study information and incentives using the tools of game theory. So that was part of the uh, ambiance in working with me was to have this kind of uh, focus. And that was just an opportune time to do basic work because it's a new paradigm in economics and it uh, led to you know, new, uh, new accomplishments in, the, in economics, which then got it recognized that way. So I think of it as that we were all part of a uh, new stream of development in economic thought. Got it. Uh, so let, let's discuss a little bit your, your award-winning contributions to auctions in, in the real world. So when people think about auctions, they typically have in mind like buying or selling on eBay or like in an art gallery. But, but the auctions that you designed are, are more, a bit more complicated th than, than that. So can you tell us a bit about what kind of auctions you designed and what problems you, you were trying to, to solve? Well, okay, so there are many different uh, levels of this. I mean, Paul has been involved in these many, much more complicated uh, auction designs that maybe he can describe. Uh, the spectrum auctions were just a, we, we sought an auction that would allocate licenses among telephone companies for the use of the spectrum. So like uh, in the initial allocation, there was a Northern California license, two of them, and two Southern California licenses, and so on, all across. So there were uh, 100 licenses to be allocated among you know, 20 different uh, entities that would like to acquire the licenses and offer cell phone service. And the, uh, the, the Federal Communications Commission had already anticipated, because of a very wonderful man there, Evan Quirrell, who was a real uh, proponent of using auctions to allocate public resources. And they had issued what's called a, a NOPER, a Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, which is the way the government uh, initiates uh, new projects. And um, Paul and I were asked by Pacific Bell, Pacific Telephone, what was it? It was Pacific Bell, yeah. Pacific Bell. They said, you know, you be consultants with us, but, actually, but you will prepare a proposed um, respond, a response to the NOPER, a proposed market design, here in this case an auction design, that um, would be submitted in the name of the of Pacific Bell, right? So... Uh, so that work was one of the, addressing the problem of allocating many different heterogeneous items uh, all at one time, so not in sequence. No, and they had to be offered in such a way that the cell phone companies could acquire packages of licenses, right? Because if you're... Pacific Bell, obviously, you'd want to have a Northern California license and a Southern California license. So it's very important that, that they acquire the package of one of each. And the true, you know, if you're AT&T, they wanted them in New York and Chicago and Los Angeles, and they wanted an even more, a bigger package of licenses. So you had to enable that to happen and to happen efficiently and recognize the various incentives and so on. And um, there were innovative ideas in that auction design. It became, a, what's called it, a simultaneous ascending auction. And it uh, has been widely used both for allocating spectrum licenses, but also for many other goods now. Um, but for me, uh, 
I mean, I had had previous experience with the oil industry in setting up auctions for oil leases, which is, of course, frowned upon these days. But I mean, <laughs> in 19, uh, let's see, that would be in 1960s, there was uh, there were a problem of allocating licenses among oil companies for drilling for exploration in the outer continental shelf. And I worked both with the Department of Interior and with later, separately, <laughs> as a consultant to oil companies who bid in those kinds of auctions. Um, and I worked some on timber auctions, things like that. So the, th the point is that the auct auctions are used as a way of allocating resources in, you know, in a bunch of different contexts, different kinds of commodities. They have different technical aspects. And the spectrum auction that got so much attention was novel because of this thing of people building packages of okay. the licenses. Right. So, so maybe, maybe, maybe I'll, let's go a little bit in more uh, depth on this just uh, um, for the audience to, to get a sense of this. So, for example, we can talk about, uh, let's say, this radio spectrum auction as an example. I know that many of the aspects are the same for the mobile, mobile phones, but, but maybe let's start with the basics for a second. Like, what, are, like what, are radio spect what is a radio spectrum? <laughs> you know, why, why does the U.S. Uh, Federal Commission's, Communications Commission, the FCC, uh, license it, and why, why is an auction a good way to do it as opposed to some of the, the, other, the other ways? Maybe Paul, I'll ask you. <laughs> sure, sure. So you're asking about the history, sort of. So um, history goes back after uh, Marconi invented radio communications, right? The, um, uh, the people started uh, putting up radio stations. Uh, people, other people had receivers, and they quickly discovered that uh, there was interference, that there, there was a narrow uh, set of frequencies that the receivers then would receive, and uh, different radio stations would put up their receivers, and, uh, but they weren't right on top of each other, but there would be many people at the boundary that would receive both signals that would interfere, and, and then the way you uh, got your signal heard was you made it louder than the other guy's signal, and it was a terrible mess, and actually uh, Herbert Hoover was actually, before he was president, was the first chairman of what was called the Federal Radio Commission, which was supposed to clean up that mess. And it evolved into what became the Federal Communications Commission, which licenses different parts of spectrum for dis different uses. Everything from, you know, uh, baby monitors to garage door openers to mobile telephones, radio, television. Each gets a little slice of, of uh, frequencies they can use to uh, communicate information. And they have limited capacity. Um, and uh, the, but they were, they were rolled out relatively slowly in the early days, so before there were auctions, uh, before the 1990s, um, the, the, uh, somebody would want to create a new television station in Topeka, Kansas, and the FCC would say, oh yeah, we have some spare spectrum there, or there'd be two people, and they would do a comparative hearing, and it would be a political process to see uh, who got the right to, uh, to use the spectrum. But with the invention of the mobile telephone, by the 1980s, there were lots, hundreds of people applying to get licenses, and it overwhelmed the FCC. And this is just a quick run through the history. Um, so the FCC asked for authority to auction the licenses, but uh, Congress didn't want to do that because what we had at the time, anyway, we, the, the executive and the Congress were split, and they didn't, couldn't agree on what the rules would be. So instead, they gave them the authority to, to run lotteries uh, for if multiple people applied. And, and then everybody started applying. There was law firms that specialized in putting in applications to join the lottery. So a dentist won the right to serve Long Island. And you know, I mean, when a land turns around and sells the license, eventually um, uh, we got a, a unified uh, uh, Congress and executive, I think it was under Clinton, and, we, uh, and they decided, OK, you, we can run auctions and, and get the licenses to those who have the highest value for them and uh, not, uh, not overwhelm the system and not just have these uh, random uh, allocations and get some revenue for the government, too. And so that's uh, how auctions came about in the United States. And 
and that was in 1992, and then in uh, 1993, the notice of proposed rulemaking that Bob mentioned, and, and uh, by the way, I, I'll anticipate one of the questions you told me you were gonna ask me. I was just, I had never done anything but theory at the time, I mean, really, and, and I was an undergraduate math major and studied some economics, but it, and when Pacific Bell asked me to look at the notice of proposed rulemaking, even though I'd written about auctions, auction theory, I thought, you know, I don't know anything about that. And they said, but, you know, take a look. And so they handed me, and they handed Bob separately, we were both approached separately originally, copies of this, and I looked at what was proposed, and my reaction was, well, I don't know what the best thing to do is, but I can do better than that. <laughs> and uh, they had no clue about how to allocate 100 licenses at a time to bidders who wanted different packages. And by the way, for anybody who's studying computer science out here, what I didn't know at the time and came to gradually understand, there are huge computational issues associated with this. The allocation problems that are involved were very hard. We were looking at this in a really, really simplified uh, perspective and said, you know, the, the bidders have no clue what the prices are for the other licenses when they're bidding for, for the first licenses. We can fix that. And that's the... And, and, and so this was a big step forward over what existed before, but nothing like what theory says is needed, so we, we didn't get to the point of, of, of actually uh, uh, getting the, so we, we drew on what we understood, and what we understood at the time was competitive equilibrium theory, you know, that we wanted a, people to know the prices so they would know what to bid for. Um, and so we designed an auction where everything would be sold at once and created some new software that would do it, because that was uh, something I was, again, something we were learning about at the time. You know, there were spreadsheets then, which was the early, early days of spreadsheets, uh, very primitive technologies, but we put together something that worked a lot better than what was proposed, uh, and still had a long way to go, though, before, uh, uh, before it could solve some of the problems we, we deal with today. So, so one, of, one of the problems, uh, a well-known problem of uh, at least a single good auction is like the winner's curse. Mm -hmm. The idea that, uh, you know, like uh, the winner of the person who overestimates the most the value of the item actually ends up winning it. But in fact, by winning, they are not really winning because they ended up paying more than the worth of, of the item. So in, I, I bet that in a multi item auction, this is an, an issue too, and how, how, did you, how did you solve this, uh, how did your auction solve or, or like alleviate this uh, winner's curse problem? Uh, so uh, not completely, of course. The, the, um, uh, we didn't treat that as the, as the main issue, but one of the things that we did believe is that compared to a sealed bid auction, the ability to see uh, if you're trying to figure out how much you should pay for a Chicago license and you see how, many, how much people are bidding for a New York license, you get some idea. Um, you might still be wrong, but uh, and if you see the bids of others because it's an ascending auction going on, that there would be more information conveyed. We were trying to maximize the amount of information that was conveyed during the course of the auction. And, you know, we had, by the way, this whole design was thrown together in six weeks or about, and, and so... It's not like we went and did uh, uh, an extremely deep exploration. We did something that was a lot better than, than what was initially proposed, and we were trying to inform bidders about what others were doing and what the prices were like before they had to make their final decisions. That was the, uh, the principles that underlie this auction, the first yeah. auction. The, you know, I think many people, when they think about auctions, they have in mind competition. You know, people compete to, to get, uh, you know, the, 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 the good. But, but one can also think about them in terms of efficiency and, in terms of, and even in terms of fairness. Uh, could, you, could you explain how? How, how, how is that so? <laughs> like, how, how can you... <laughs> how do, yeah. Hi, Bob. You know, well... Uh, I guess most of us think of it as fairness because of the everybody has an equal opportunity to bid for something on equal terms. But in fact, there are auctions allowed. Uh, we had uh, preferential treatment of some uh, categories of, of bidders. So Native American tribes could bid with a, an advantage. Women-owned companies could bid with an advantage. So you can create 
uh, a, uh, a preference in the design. But the basic design is one of uh, uh, equal treatment. In terms of efficiency, I mean, this is the, the great, as, uh, wonderful aspects of Paul, Paul's design where all of the auctions of all these different licenses, none of these auctions close until they all close. Because what does that mean? It means that at the very end, a bidder can look around and see really a set of prices that are the prevailing prices. Uh, and all you have to do is bid a little bit more to, and you can acquire any of those ones. So that in a sense, people are responding to these existing prices in their purchases, which, so this price-taking behavior, as it's called, is a well-known sufficient condition for efficiency in these, in, of course, in private good economies, it's uh, not quite the exact model of a spectrum allocation, but um, that design is very conducive to efficiency. Yep. So, so the, Paul, you mentioned already that uh, you were mostly writing papers and you know doing economic theory uh, when you suddenly were started to get involved with real world auctions. How, how challenging was it to move from the writing papers to actually designing uh, auctions in the real world? Um, it was challenging. The, the, what we wanted to do, partly motivated by theory, was more complicated than what anybody else wanted to do. And the, the, um, our critics at the time, the representatives for the other companies said, oh, this is way too complicated. It could never work. And I remember um, I went back and forth to Washington a lot of times back then um, trying to convince people. And I remember um, uh, putting together an Excel spreadsheet. Actually, it was a, a research assistant who put together an Excel. So I said, it really isn't that hard. We can do it with just, you know, uh, just exchanging Excel spreadsheets. And they were very simple spreadsheets at the time. Um, and uh, and I, I brought one of these little three and a half inch disks to the, uh, with me. And, uh, they, and they told me, people there said, we're told this is too complicated to do. And I said, here, um, here's a, here it is coded in Excel. Um, you know, you have uh, spreadsheets for the bidders and spreadsheets for the auctioneer, which imports data from the spreadsheets for the bidders and checks whether it meets the rules and does the processing. And, and so Evan Correll, who you mentioned, took that disk home and ran it, and it worked. And he came in and recommended to the, uh, to the commission that they go ahead and adopt what we had proposed. Yeah. So it, was, uh, it involved some n new things, and it was fun and exciting and, and scary, too, because the, if it had failed, um, we would have been Stakes goats. Mind, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 the, and, and so clearly your theories improve the way that auctions is done in the world. Would you say that uh, working with practitioners in the real world improved your theories, too? Ah, well, okay, so I don't know about the, to some extent about the spectrum auctions, but um, I was mostly influenced by my work with the electric power industry. So yeah, here in uh, California and in uh, every other major jurisdiction in the United States, there was a complete restructuring of the electric power industry back in the 1990s at the same time as the spectrum auctions. So, um, you know, each uh, utility had a monopoly and they produced power and sold power and everything. They, they were a vertically integrated monopoly. And there was a lot of dissatisfaction with that among customers and regulators. And this scheme was thrown out in its entirety. Utilities had to divest all of their generation assets, and they um, uh, had to buy their power through a market. So there was a necessity then of creating a market that would, um, you know, provide us powers. You know, happening every second, every minute is electric power. 
So this power that you driving these lights was traded in Folsom over by Sacramento yesterday. And again, every five minutes all the time is a constant process. Well, setting up a market for power was uh, sort of one dimensional. It wasn't package bidding, but it was uh, seemingly simple. So for me, the learning process was, first of all, to spend a lot of time listening to engineers. I mean, that's what one, that's the whole process in a way is you, you listen to the people in the field about the problems they encounter. Well, in a case of electric power, there's actually a different price, implicit price for power at every node in the grid. So if we have, say, 300 injection points where power can be injected into the grid in California, we have 300 prices at every instant. So that's, so that, that's the way you price out the transmission from one point in the grid to another. But that's just the beginning. <laughs> because, well, there you have to, there's, we had a price for energy, but now we have prices for all of the transmission links. But that's, we're not finished. We have all the reserve categories. So there's a fluctuation on a millisecond basis in the power supply. They have to maintain the frequency. You want to have a 60 millihertz frequency. So you have to have some resources that are going up, they're generating more or less power on a millisecond basis to keep the frequency exactly 60 or very close to 60 mega, uh, hertz. in terms of hertz. And then, um, so that's some, but then we need some reserves in case of uh, major shortfalls. It might last five minutes or it might last two hours. So you have, some res have to have some assets that you, you buy an option on them that they have to be available in events of a, of a, uh, if needed. But then there are others <laughs> that, we need, that you needed, uh, you know, that will be available for two hours or 10 hours. And then you have to look ahead for three years. We got to make sure that there are power plants being built or wind farms or solar systems or wherever, that there are generation resources that are being constructed that'll take three years that'll be available. So we have a market for capacity. So this was a learning experience for me. The engineers have all of these dimensions that they're thinking about. Um, and it turns out that every one of them, you sort of need a market for that. And one way for, for virtually every one of them, it's an auction market. That's the way it's done. Well, you have something to add for like the real world improving your theories? So sure, so Bob was talking about how complex real markets are and they, they relate, markets are interrelated and relate to other things. Your question though was whether the, um, uh, the real world experience altered the theories that we used. And, and for me, they were very tightly integrated. Uh, the, the incentive auction, which we haven't talked about yet, um, 2016, we, we were um, uh, buying uh, television broadcast rights from television broadcasters, moving the remaining broadcasters onto new channels so we would clear a block of, of channels. We cleared channels 38 to 51 from television broadcast and used those to form licenses, which we then sold to mobile broadband companies. And, uh, there was no procedure for doing that in practice or in theory uh, in, in uh, 2012, when, 2011 when I was hired. And so we, um, but we had basically five years from the time I was hired till the auction was run. And uh, with Ilya Segal at the, uh, in the economics department, Kevin Leighton Brown at the uh, University of British Columbia computer scientists, we invented new algorithms and new auction methods. and. And uh, on theoretical grounds, right? Uh, they needed. They had certain theoretical properties that um, uh, we were trying to. Well, we we knew what kinds of properties we needed, and we invented a, a class of auction designs, and then chose an optimal member of that class, and ran it in a thirty billion dollar auction. Um, it was. Uh, 
but it was something that we invented and built the theory for before we built the software to run it. So it was, they, they were very, very tightly yeah. connected in my mind. Um, Paul, maybe I'll start with you on this one. I know, you know, one of the things that I've admired about, about you for, uh, for, all the, for so many years is that you know, like you, you're still very, very active in research and you still work with, you're working with students. You know, like there is no sign of you slowing down uh, you know, like after receiving the, the, the Nobel Prize. Uh, uh, so I wanted to ask, you know, what are you working on these days and what that you're excited about? Oh my, oh yeah, so well, so the, the, I did slow down a little bit right after the incentive auction. I wasn't quite sure what I was gonna do next. And uh, there's a graduate student here at uh, GSB, uh, Billy Ferguson, who um, approached me about a problem on water rights. And it's, uh, it's about the allocation of water. Um, along with uh, Buzz Thompson, who's a professor at the law school, who's an expert in water law and uh, an, an environmentalist of, of note. Um, we wondered whether we could improve the allocation of water, which, which has been, as if you've been following things, at least until last year, it looked like it was gonna be a huge problem. It's still a huge problem. The Colorado River, the reservoirs are very low compared to where they were 20 years ago. We were at risk of, of uh, Deadpool in the, uh, behind the big dams, the Hoover Dam and the Glen Canyon Dam. Um, and could we allocate water better? And that's another, um, very complicated resource allocation problem. It's complicated because the hydrology is complicated. It's complicated because uh, unlike most physical resources, water is a resource that doesn't get used just once. When you put water into a ground to, to irrigate, irrigate crops, um, a certain fraction of that water goes down into an aquifer where it can be pumped again or goes back into the river where the very same molecules get used again. So you don't have the traditional economic adding up constraints that there's the total amount of, anyway, it's, it's a complicated resource. And many of these things I've described are not well measured. So we don't really know when you put um, uh, water onto your uh, crops on a field where, where the water is going and how much and when. Um, so it's, it's very hard. And the question is, could we create uh, uh, markets for water that allowed water to be put to its best uses. Right now, uh, just to give you an example, I don't, I don't want to go into too much detail, but if you go to Southern California, uh, if, if, you are, um, if you're in San Diego and, and they, they have a desalination plant in San Diego that costs about uh, more than $2,000 an acre foot for the water that it produces. And, and meanwhile, in the Imperial Valley, right next to them, uh, the water comes from uh, uh, basically from the Colorado River for $20 an acre foot. There's just vast differences in the value of water in different uses and, and what different people pay for water, leading to tremendous waste and inefficiency. And uh, the question is, can we fix that? And uh, uh, so I'm working currently with Billy and Buzz and, and others on, um, uh, on the question of can we find a way to do what will be an incentive auction. I don't know how far you want me to go, but will be, you want me to go on a little bit? Is, I is it, but uh, you, you can, but let me just say, you know, like, so isn't much of it a problem of uh, property rights in this particular case as opposed to auction? Yeah. Very, very good. So that's, so really what happened was that the, I came to see the incentive auction, which I described to you as a complicated allocation process before. I came to see it as a process of converting property rights. That we had, uh, we had television broadcast rights, which was a particular, you might, you might ask yourself if you'd studied traditional economics, um, why the government needed to be involved at all. Why didn't you know, just the local television station sell its rights to AT&T and if it was more valuable to AT&T? And, and the answer is that the rights were just the wrong kind. They, they, they don't fit together, they couldn't be, the rights for television broadcast were not really usable for mobile broadband, they were different rights. They inter the uses interfered with each other, but they didn't provide the same uh, kinds of rights. And, and what we did in the incentive auction, in my new conception of it, is we changed one kind of right to a different kind of right by buying a package of rights, moving things around and converting them. And what needs to be done in water is something similar. The, the uh, existing rights are, were created for historical reasons. They made sense 150 years ago. 
Um, they don't make any sense today. They, uh, they totally block uh, uh, improvements because, you know, I'm not allowed to sell my water to San Diego because it will affect the flow onto Bob's field. And the, the rights just don't fit together in a useful way. And, and so what we want to do is uh, create an auction process that will change one kind of rights into another, allow on a voluntary basis participants to sell one kind of right, buy another kind of right that will, um, uh, that will enable trade to take place in water. Bob, what about you? What are you excited about these days? Uh, well, I am genuinely retired, so <laughs> <laughs> unlike Paul. Uh, so I retired 20 years ago. So I have, but I, I work on foundational issues in game theory. So uh, those are very theoretical, foundational set of axioms and so on. So that's uh, it's purely of a, a narrow academic intellectual interest. Got it. So, so you know, before before we before I open it up for questions from the audience, maybe maybe each of you can tell us, you know, what advice do you have for students interested in, in economics, uh, in pursuing economics or auctions, or uh, what advice would you have for them? Oh. We start with Bob. Well, I'm very uh, cynical about economics. <laughs> Every the economics I always learned was, I don't know, supply equals demand. There are supply curves and demand curves and they intersect and that's the price and so on. And uh, I just have such uh, uh, scorn <laughs> for that way of uh, viewing things. I mean, I think of economy as driven by markets, people participating, that there are rules and procedures and uh, it's a... Uh, yeah, there's all this detail, and you know, different people have different information. For example, you know, financial markets information is so critical, and you're trying to make inferences from things you see. We talked about this thing of making inferences from other people's bidding behavior. So uh, I've just, uh, you know, in terms of studying economics, I would certainly say that having a, a very close attention to the complexities of the way real markets are run is the, uh, to me, is the, should be the driving force that one has, the curiosity to say, how does it actually work? Paul. Okay, so you asked about advice for students, right? And, and you know, I think, um, uh, there are changes taking place that are massive in what you need to know to be a successful economist in the future. I mean, big data is affecting everything, certainly affecting economics. We have, you know, uh, really interesting work being done on, on subjects that matter to us today, on climate change, on income inequality, and, you know, uh, I'm picking up water rights, a little piece of the uh, environmental economics area. But, but we also have, you know, new methods, new ways to, so, Along with the detailed data, we have new methods for understanding them. And you all know what's going on uh, with uh, uh, large language models and all this other. We, we have so many new things that are very likely to change the way those analyses take place. And on the theoretical side, too, the, the, um, uh, I described to you the way that we created that Bob and I created the, uh, the first spectrum auctions with a very primitive theory that we were using. Basically, we wanted as much information in the hands of bidders as possible before the auction came to an end. But uh, what, what we didn't say to you when we described all of that as we, as we incorporate computational ideas into, uh, into what we're doing is that, gee, you know, the, the, a process in which prices only increase may never find equilibrium uh, market clearing prices they're not guaranteed they're not guaranteed to exist and if they do exist they're not guaranteed to come from any monotonic computational process and how do we take into account the, the complexity of constraints and how do we take into account the uh, the, uh, the so it, I, I've been learning over the last 10 years or so a lot more computer science and the, the uh, uh, and addressing and the in the work that I do, uh, computational issues. When we deal with hydrology, we're certainly going to have a lot of uh, hard computational issues to, uh, to deal with. So I think you know people need to place their bets about 
what are important uh, ideas, important domains of knowledge to master, and, and they're going to find them useful in, in studying the economy going forward, where we look at details much beyond 100 years ago when all you needed to know was supply and demand curves. Uh, we yeah. need to know a lot more than that uh, to, make the, uh, uh, to, to make markets that work well or make economic institutions that work well. And you, know, you need to educate yourself in that stuff to be prepared. I was telling you, again, what, what I thought we were disagreeing about earlier was that you know, we have certain perspectives and we bring them to the problems. That's what we did in 1993 and 94. We, we brought some, it, it, it made things a lot better, but we missed a whole lot of stuff too because we didn't know anything about these other issues and, and they were not incorporated into the design. Mm -hmm. And that's why uh, we can make designs that are better now than the ones we did you know, 30 years ago. Bob Wilson, Paul Milgram, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. The floor is open to questions. Thank you, Dr. Milgram and Dr. Uh, Wilson for your uh, insightful talk. Um, my main question was, um, you touched on markets that already exist that currently run on auction models. Um, and I was wondering, what are some uh, markets that currently exist that don't run on auction models that you think would greatly benefit from running on auction models? You want to restate that question? So. Cool. I have I've mostly been concerned about improving the auction models that uh, that do exist. We don't have we don't have markets. Uh, we don't have very much more trading going on in water, as I've already described to you, largely because the property rights are wrong. I don't know what you mean when 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 one asks about an auction model. I ask about um, everything that's required to uh, uh, to make that market work well. And one of the things that's required is to is to get the property rights correct. Um, we move toward, you know, I'm thinking about in recent years past, we've moved over recent years to auctioning, for example, the, the rights to show ads to you on, on, the, uh, on the way. If I knew what those things I would be working on or would already have done a bunch of them, I guess, um, uh, with the, you, you, every time you, uh, you see an ad appear in front of you on the web, there's been an auction that was run to determine who gets to show that to you. I guess there are lots of things as, the, um, as we get better and better about um, uh, being able to measure uh, all the things that we measure better, uh, we're, we're in a better position to create markets for. So it could be, um, uh, you know, I'm not sure what resources we're talking about. We certainly need more in the environmental domain than all sorts of things in the environmental domain. Let's see who's speaking. Kir. Paul, over there. Go, go for it. Where is it? I can't see the speaker. Oh, you can't. Who's? <laughs> okay. Yes, perfect. Oh, there's somebody, okay. Hi. Thank <laughs> well. you so much for being here. Um, it is just like an honor to hear you talk about your work. I'm curious as to if there's been any work in um, auction design in terms of willingness to save is like, making a bid to like save a certain amount of money, making a bid to yourself in the future, um, or like just approaching auctions and market design from instead of buying something, but rather a willingness to like save money. So my hearing's not so good. <laughs> I don't know what to do. The question is like, is there, a, is there a thinking to think about auctions as a, you know, from the perspective of like uh, enable people to save maybe more money and uh, and stuff like that, as opposed to just from the perspective of the of firms bidding on like a large item or something like that. You know, the, so what there are, I mean, the the you're making me think of things like rotating credits associates. Is that what you have in mind? Something like Roscas or um, so there are um, uh, in developing countries in some places what are called rotating credit associations. Um, rotating savings and credit, something like that, where the uh, groups of people, um, uh, uh, you know, say a group of farmers, the, the, there's, each of them wants to buy something that's of a, 
let's say, a piece of equipment that's too expensive for any of them to afford individually, and they all uh, chip in and take turns um, uh, with who has the opportunity to buy. And, um, uh, and those often involve an auction as, as to who will agree to, uh, to take the least or to chip in the most um, in order to, uh, 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 to be the one who is chosen for, for that year. So there, there are um, there's some applications like that. I'm not sure what other kinds of applications you might have in mind, but there are some. Hi. Um, I'm curious to know if um, y'all study human behavior at all, and if, in terms of market sentiment, you, do you, can you use auctions to study behavior using auction theory? Well, let me respond to the, uh, like here at Stanford in the Experimental Economics Laboratory, Auctions are the principal means by which they study behavior because people's uh, uh, behavior in an auction can represent uh, more or less uh, sort of rational calculation and people are more or less risk averse. There are, um, I mean, a lot of people say we're talking about the winner's curse. I mean, most people uh, find it difficult <laughs> to to take account of that sort of thing. So they have, uh, um, sort of a, um, it's a platform where you sort of can see many dimensions of, of, of people's behavior, at least their economic behavior. And, um, and to what extent even their strategic, you know, some of these markets to participate in them, you have to be rather clever. And so, um, I don't know, I would just give you an example. Okay, so, so at Caltech, they have a, a laboratory, much like the one here at Stanford. And uh, they have this beautiful e experiment in which they have an asset that pays a dividend of $10 every period for 10 periods, and then it's stops, that's it, it becomes worthless. And this, these are allocated initially in some way, and then a market opens. And the people in the, the subjects in the laboratory can uh, bid for these, these assets. If you own the asset at a given period and it pays a $10 dividend and you own the asset, you get the $10. So the students, they're typically engineering students at Caltech, and they uh, bid very actively for these. So what happens? Well, you say, well, <clears throat> the asset's gonna pay $10 for each of 10 periods, so its value is about $100, and as time goes on, its value is decreasing. So it's 100, 90, 80, 70. Uh, what do we see in the market? The price hovers around 100 and 90 and 80. The true value, I mean the re redemption value, is going to zero, but it doesn't happen that way in the market. Why is that? Well, people, when they participate in these markets, they have this very speculative motive. It's like, gee, I think I can resell this at a profit, so I'm gonna bid even though it's presently worth 50, I'm gonna bid 60 or 70 for it because I think I could resell it to somebody else who's not as smart as I am for more. And so these people wind up doing all of this trading at prices uh, far, uh, of course at the end there's a collapse. And the, they have this wonderful way at Caltech that a, each price uh, transaction is given a, a sound. So if it's a high price, it's, it has a high frequency like beep. And if it's a low price, it's like boom, okay? So as you watch the market go on, it goes beep, 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 beep. You're listening to the transactions through this sort of music that's generated. 
Well, what happens is that there's this long, high-frequency kind of noise that's going on, and you're approaching the end. What's going to happen? There are all these, some people say, this is craziness. That thing isn't worth that much. So you say, boom, boom, boom. There are people who are disagreeing with what's going on in the market and think that, that, that this price is way too high and they're offering much lower prices. Well, at the very end, they go boom, 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 like that. So it's fun to watch, and you could watch it on a movie, but it's very revealing that you put a bunch of people in a, an environment in which they can be speculative, <laughs> they'll do it. <laughs> and they'll do it in a way that's just so far removed from uh, <clears throat> you know, what theoretical economists are supposing happens. I mean, it's, if people behave that real way, that way on the New York Stock Exchange or the Mercantile Exchange, they would be quickly undone by you know, counter-traders. But in the laboratory, uh, it goes on and on until the thing finally collapses catastrophically. So it's this kind of behavior that is uh, actually brought out by having them participate in a, in a market. And it's, and it's an auction market. Yeah. Hey, um, thanks um, for, for your talk. And I really appreciate all of the good insights on um, auction theory. I was wondering, you mentioned um, LLMs, and that all obviously begs the question of um, multi-round simultaneous auctions being run entirely by um, auction bots, right? There's only two to three big players in a lot of these um, radio spectrum or you know, water property rights um, auctions. Um, how do you foresee the future of, of auctions just um, in terms of um, AI technology and, and everyone creating their own um, AI bots and essentially it being a competition between um, three or four algorithms that people have created. Okay, so that, I think that one's for me. Right? That's uh, right. So um, when you say three or four big players, you're thinking of Europe. Uh, that's not the way it is in the US actually. There, there is a, a, lot of, or a, a lot of participation. There are three or four giants, but um, uh, uh, three giants, but there's a lot of participation by smaller uh, companies, so it isn't the, the characterization isn't quite right. Um, these auctions, I, I'm not sure if you understand the uh, stakes that are involved. For example, a couple of years ago when, when we did the C-band auction, the, uh, the revenue was $85 billion uh, transacted in the auction. Uh, the Verizon alone had something like $50 billion worth of uh, uh, spending. They don't hand that over to a bot. The, uh, those, um, those decisions uh, are approved by the CEO when they're made, right? The, uh, uh, the, the company rises and falls on, on, uh, on decisions like that, and they can't explain to their shareholders, well, I bid that much because um, some, some bot did it. At least that's the way it was uh, a couple of years ago and, and the way it still is today. Um, it's hard for me to predict exactly how much reliance we'll have on, uh, on, on AI in the future, presumably more than we have today, but I don't know that it's going to, um, uh, uh, that we're gonna, re that the CEO is ever going to delegate the, uh, uh, a decision like that to um, uh, at any time in my lifetime anyway to, uh, 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 to a bot. Um, the, on, on smaller, uh, there, there's a lot of small high frequency auctions um, that you could very well imagine um, uh, seeing that stuff going on and then understanding, then there'll be a lot to understand. It, and we have research going on actually uh, uh, where people are trying to understand what happens when the bots compete with each other. Uh, when is collusion more likely to emerge? Uh, does it, you know, if the bots are using learning algorithms to figure out what, lear you know, uh, what happens, will they learn to collude with each other? Will they learn to compete? Uh, we at Auctionomics, my company, have done some experiments with, uh, uh, with learning in, uh, in auctions. And uh, uh, you may know that in, in two person, if you're studying computer science, two-person zero-sum games, and even very complicated games, the, the, uh, uh, the, the learning algorithms can learn to play very well. We've seen, uh, uh, 
We've seen algorithms play poker better than human poker players. Uh, but, in, but as soon as you get more complicated than that, they don't do better than humans, at least yet. And uh, part of the reason is that the, uh, the, the bots in a zero-sum game can learn just by playing against each other. But in a non-zero-sum game, uh, to play well, you have to predict what your opponent's going to do. Um, in a zero-sum game, there's such a thing as an optimal strategy. There's, there's a best way to play, and, and the machines can learn it. But in a, in a non-zero-sum game or in a multiplayer uh, game, the, uh, the best way to play depends on what others are going to do. And you don't learn that by playing against other computers. You can only learn that by playing against humans. Uh, so, the, uh, so the learning algorithms, at, at least as far as we've worked, have not been successful uh, in learning to play uh, those games well. I don't know what the future holds. I think that's a reasonable question to ask. Um, but uh, we're certainly not there yet where we can uh, uh, hand off these kinds of decisions to software robots. Um, hi. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, you, you talked a lot about um, working with engineers and other experts um, and how that practical experience and like informed your theoretical contributions. Um, did most of that changing of like your theoretical kind of how you saw theory was that mostly into like purely on design on designing auctions and designing markets or did it also come from like what could you classify as an incentive what could you call a property right what could be a resource did it mostly just come from the pure like design of it or did it also change other ways about how you could see how people could play a game and how people could see things within a market or auction do you want to talk I couldn't understand it, so you'll have to either restate it or answer it. So, in, you know, I don't sort of divide these things into categories like that. If, I, if, I'm, trying to, uh, uh, if I'm trying to help solve the uh, water allocation problem in California, I'm not going to break it up into a bunch of separate technical buckets. I, you need to diagnose uh, why the, you know, why we don't have working markets now. You need to fix all the pieces of it. And, and I don't sort of separate it into, um, I, I think of, of getting the rights designed correctly. Or even, even in a traditional market, let me just take you, I'll give you one example, because I don't want to make this uh, thing go too far. But take a, a, just something traditional. Take a, a, the, the original radio spectrum auctions, where we were dealing with things that were fairly primitive. The, there was still a question of what exactly you sold. Did you sell? Uh, Northern and Southern California rights? Did you sell a national right? Did you, um, uh, did you sell separately the frequencies that are used for uplink, where your uh, message is from your phone to the, uh, 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 to the network, uh, from, the, from the messages from the spectrum that's used for downlink, which is in a different part of the spectrum? Or did you sell, we, what we decided to do was to sell paired spectrum, where anybody who uh, bought a license would get a certain amount of uplink and a certain amount of downlink together with that license. There were always questions of uh, what the product consists of. And um, uh, you know, it's geographic uh, uh, coverage, it's pairing, it's uh, spectrum bandwidth uh, coverage. There were always questions like that that were part of the design. It's never a matter of just what are the auction rules. So um, uh, when, when you're solving a real problem, you solve whatever the problem is, I guess is my answer. So I have Professor seen. Milgram, thank you so much for sharing your work on water allocation. I, I really appreciate the insights. Um, in environmental economics right now, there is quite a bit of debate on the new auction design for the efficient allocation of pollution permits, and I wanted to get your perspective on this and whether there is a lot of potential in this work going forward. Yeah, I, I, haven't, done, um, I haven't done any work on that, and so... Um, I, the stuff that I've seen, that I've talked to people about, um, you probably are, and this is a good example, it connects to the question we've just heard of what it is you're buying and selling. You know, uh, carbon offsets I've been asked about. And, um, you know, carbon offsets, one of the big problems with it is, you know, when is an offset real? If somebody agrees not to cut down a forest, but they need wood, will they not cut down this forest and just cut down another forest instead? When is it? The words I guess they use in the environmental literature is that is it additional 
and is it permanent, stuff like, words like that. The, is it actually, um, so, so the, the product definition and guaranteeing that the uh, uh, projects do what they say they're going to do and are actually beneficial, those become, uh, you know, big parts of, of, um, of having environmental markets that, uh, that work well. And I think that connects to the question you asked, that uh, uh, it's not enough just to, uh, just to make auction rules. I think the, the auction rules are that for these kinds of markets, if they're properly, say, if we're doing carbon emissions, um, the, the auction rules that are needed are relatively simple. What, but what's harder is uh, enforcement and rights and how do you know that uh, uh, people aren't cheating and, and uh, th those kinds of issues. Hello. Thank you so much, first off, for taking the time to talk to us today. Um, Dr. Mildrum, I had a question about your, what you thought about alternative transfer methods or other ways of renting water rights as opposed to simply selling them. Do you think that has a future, or how would that play into the auction market? Yeah, so the, ab absolutely. So the, um, one of the things about uh, water is um, uh, you, can, you can permanently sell, uh, well, in principle, you could permanently sell the rights that come uh, that you own, or you could uh, just sell the current entitlement that is the the um, uh, or the current allocation what you're using uh, during the current season, for example. And uh, I think the latter is a very important part of what what we need when we have uh, better water allocation. Well, again, to to give an example that I think everybody will understand. Uh, we have some farmers who are growing annual crops, and they can let uh, land lay fallow this year and not, uh, uh, and not plant those crops. We have other farmers that are growing trees that need water on those trees every year, even in a, low, even in a, a dry season when there's, uh, or a dry year when we have uh, very little rainfall. They still need water or the trees will die, and, and that's a permanent loss. And so we need to have um, the kind of temporary trading that you were just uh, the, that you were just asking about. And we're also going to need uh, some of the longer term adjustments we have, you know, if uh, Phoenix is going to grow. Uh, I don't know if it should or not, but if, uh, but if Phoenix continues to grow, it needs a, uh, a secure long term source of water that um, in, in, instead of just every year trying to scramble to fill its needs. So we need all of that, uh, uh, not just uh, one or the other. Hello. <clears throat> Thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering to what extent are probabilistic models incorporated in auctions? Um, this could be from the auctioneer's perspective. It could be like in terms of what's the probability of like the auction <clears throat> people participating in the auctions getting the information they need. Just to what extent is probability used? I don't understand these. No. You don't understand the question. Okay. I'll, uh, so to what extent is probability? We do simulations that are probabilistic, um, uh, Monte Carlo simulations and, and such. We do them both, both for bidders and uh, sometimes for trying to figure out what's going to happen um, uh, uh, in an auction. When we did the incentive auction, uh, uh, for example, uh, par as part of the design, we had these computationally very difficult problems to solve, these NP-complete uh, uh, allocation uh, uh, problems that we were solving. And uh, we had to do about 10,000 of them during the course of the auction to check whether certain things were feasible. Uh, and, and we generated uh, beforehand a large number with, with simulation methods, uh, uh, a large number of packages that might emerge during the course of the auction use that to create a data set to optimize a, uh, uh, a feasibility checking algorithm that would be used to check whether any particular allocation uh, uh, was feasible so, and, to, and to have those things run fast. Um, there, I, I haven't seen them used very much in, th in the theory for, the, for practical designs. Prob probabilistic randomized allocations are uh, very much being studied uh, by theorists looking at what optimal designs are. Um, uh, so far, we haven't made great use of them in the design itself, but in testing designs, we make a, a lot of use of probabilistic methods and simulation methods. We'll have time for one more question. 
I hope I understand this one. Hello? Okay. Uh, hello, Dr. Milgram and Dr. Wilson. It was a pleasure to listen to both of you speak about auctions. Uh, my question is, does, and is, the, is the effectiveness or success of an incentive auction differ in a nascent market versus a long-established and traditional market? Yes, yeah, so the you asked specifically about the incentive auction. And uh, the incentive auction, as the, there's only been one of those run so far, and I'm thinking about another one now. So, uh, so I, general, you understand I'm generalizing theoretically here. Uh, it's, it's for us a, a situation in which rights are well established because there has been historical use and where they're not functional today because the rights are inappropriate for, um, you know, for, for, uh, for the modern world. And uh, that's something that, you know, there was an established pattern of use. We're trying to ch uh, change that to something else by creating new proper, property rights and by using the extra value that's created to induce uh, some people to, uh, to sacrifice the rights they have in exchange for, uh, for a new kind of rights that we think are more valuable. It, in, in the United States, property rights are constitutionally protected, so we can't take them away and force people to change to new rights. We have to make it profitable for them. And the, and the point is to create a system in which, and, and some people are, are not going to agree. I mean, we aren't going to get universal participation. So we have to create a system in, uh, that will work if we get most people to participate um, and that compensate them for that from the extra value that's being created. Uh, and we'll get that extra value by selling the new rights either back to them or to somebody else. Uh, and and you know, those are, those are among the you know, central ideas that are used in, in uh, incentive auction design. Bob and Paul, thank you for a fascinating mm -hmm. conversation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.